Well, good morning, everyone. So, this morning I'm going to talk about the mysterious megalithic walls of central Italy. Um, they're an embarrassment to the archaeologists of Italy because they hint at an early date of construction. Uh, recent research by independent researchers have put the dating of these walls back to 5000 BC. Um, but, of course, historians and archaeologists can't believe that they were built at that period because that means the Neolithic people built them and they couldn't have done it with flint axes. So, that brings to the question, was there an advanced race around at that time? And living not just in ancient Greece, but in central Italy. So, I'm going to take you on a tour of some of our findings and... Uh, See what you think. Now, I'm not plugging this because it's, it's my first book, but it relates to the Etruscan adventure. Um, now, the Etruscans were a great civilization that lived in central Italy for about 600 years, um, from 1000 BC to about 300 BC. And I first came across this civilization through my research of the Isle of Portland and Dorset. And the museum on Portland houses these incredible artefacts. Um, some of them are Iron Age ingots that um, have been processed ready for trade. And I discovered Portland was an ancient island that was inhabited by Phoenicians. And they continue their bloodlines, the Phoenician bloodlines on Portland, right up until recent times because the, the kings of England wanted them to remain separate from the politics of the mainland to continue the trade from Europe. So Portland is a very important place indeed, and um, I found it an island full of mystery. And one of the many mysteries was the coffins that uh, were dug up um, around the Verne, the hill fort that dominates the island. And they were identical to coffins that we'd um, seen in museums in Italy, uh, particularly the Etruscan museums. And so this slide here shows a mixture of Portland coffins and Etruscan coffins. So we've got an Etruscan coffin here, Portland coffin here, Portland coffin here, Etruscan coffin there. And these Etruscan coffins date from 500 BC. So and these coffins on Portland are said to be Roman, but they're nothing like the Roman coffins in other parts of the country. In fact, they're unique to Portland, having this sloping roof. Uh, but the mystery is that these coffins were buried um, over 10 feet deep on the island, which uh, really they should be standing, they are sarcophagi. So somebody, perhaps the Romans buried them to disguise that the fact that the island was uh, uh, inhabited by um, a race that they had superseded, if you like because the Romans took over everything the Etruscans had and mm -hmm. used their engineers to build their um, uh, empire and fuel their war machine. So, later on, after a few years of research on Portland, I decided to make a few trips to uh, Italy and I managed to meet up with Giovanni Fio, who to me is sort of one of the great alternative writers in Italy. And he's been writing about the mystery of the Etruscan for many, many years. Unfortunately, very few of the books are translated into English, but nevertheless, um, after painstakingly translating his book, um, I got the idea of what he was saying. But he speaks good English, and he gave us a guided tour of the area around Pitliagano, which is a great two for valleys um, in the south of Tuscany. And there he showed me these great rock cut passages um, that were carved out of solid rock through, um, through the valleys, leading to um, burial mounds, uh, sometimes leading to Acropolis, um, sometimes leading to um, the rivers or wells or sacred places. They're, they're sacred passages, basically. But their purpose is a mystery, and um, so I'm, I'm a great lover of mysteries, so I became fascinated with the spirit of the Etruscan, thanks to Giovanni Fio. And um, so I decided to do some research on the um, Etruscans, and um, they were a fascinating race. 
Um, they dominated the area from the Po River in the north to the central Campania. They had um, basically 12 cities around a central shrine to, to the mother goddess, Voltulma. So um, that reminded me of the Celts <coughs> and um, some of the themes of John Michel. Um, and um, they ruled an area that um, basically ruled the Mediterranean, from that area of Italy, they ruled the Mediterranean in their maritime trade. But um, there was little left at their capital city of Tarquinia, which uh, is now just fields but with a, a, a hut that will take you to some of their painted tombs. So we, we want, I want to see some of the Etruscan buildings and get a feel of their architecture. So the best place to go was, was Vulci, which as you can see on the plan is northwest of Rome. And Vulci is a spectacular setting, two for valleys with um, great gorges, uh, lakes. And this is a view from the city looking down to some of the uh, gorges around. So it was a highly protected uh, plateau, so a perfect place to build a city. Um, and then here we found some of these wonderful ancient uh, preserved Etruscan walls, which, according to George Dennis, the great 19th century antiquarian, are built in the emplectron style, which means they were uh, lengthways and endways alternating. That was the way the Etruscans built their walls. And generally squared blocks. And often they find that they're framed by these um, sort of curved stones <clears throat> to make a kind of frieze or cornice around the buildings. And at Severteri, it's one of the great cemeteries of, of the Etruscan, you can see this same architecture in plectron masonry, corbelling, um, cornicing. And, um, but at this cemetery we came across um, other uh, tombs which seemed to be earlier. <clears throat> Some of these round tombs had almost like oriental styled um, cornicing and um, even these strange round tumuli tombs. Some of them had polygonal masonry in them which is like separate um, individual stones of different shapes all fitted together perfectly so you couldn't even get a knife between the joints. It's, and some of the stones are so large that uh, they were over two or three tons and measuring over five feet high by six feet long. So um, and I started to wonder about this masonry, but um, here are some of the painted tombs from, this, uh, from that particular early tomb there. Uh, it reminded me of the, the ancient Egyptians and certainly in, in, um, in style and colouring it was very impressive. Um, so we decided to visit one of the 12 federation cities of the Etruscans, and one of them was Perugia. And Perugia has this unique archaeological site, um, because its walls still date back to the Etruscans. Um, so these walls date back from 600 BC, and it's, this one's called the Etruscan Gate. So these, this masonry you see here, is from 600 BC, and the Romans have added to the gate and probably built this section up here, which looks newer, as earthquakes have caused splits over the centuries in the old masonry. So it was a good example of Etruscan masonry. So we got addicted to a lot of the Etruscan sites and decided to visit all the 12. Um, one of them is called Roselle on the coast of Tuscany. And on its uh, plateau, its, uh, its central area, there are typical Roman buildings and some Etruscan buildings. But um, around the outside of the city were these great massive megalithic walls <coughs> that were made from great boulders. And they were, they were put together with rough boulders and then cut right down. So you can see that looking down how they've cut the rough boulders so that there's a flat surface, which is a bit of a feat. 
Um, nevertheless, some of these boulders weigh over several tons. And they didn't seem anything like the Etruscan walls that we'd seen in all the cities we'd visited. In fact, the guidebook uh, to Roselle says that those megalithic walls are Etruscan. I said, well, it doesn't feel right. They, they look older, they're worn, they're more weathered, um, they're not squared. So it felt as if they were from an earlier period, but there was no information to help us into who may have built these walls. And then we had decided to visit Kosa because we had, there was a, a reference in George Dennis's book, The Cemeteries of Victoria, that there are polygonal walls there. Um, so I got interested in, in the polygonal walls after seeing them in the cemetery. So we went to um, a place called Kosa, which is uh, just north of Rome on the coast. And um, the, the, the central area, again, had the typical Roman masonry, which you find even in this country, um, the sort of rubble infilling. Um, and then we found the typical Implectron Etruscan walls with the cornicing. Uh, but further along, we saw that there was a wall beneath the foundations of the Etruscan wall. <coughs> and this is polygonal. So we thought, oh, here's, here's a good example of, of Roman Etruscan and something from an earlier time. And yet all the guidebooks were saying that the polygonal walls date from the Roman times because they can't imagine a civilization um, sophisticated enough to have built these walls. So it had to be the Romans who had iron tools in order to chisel these great blocks. <coughs> And now you see my first polygonal wall. And the outer walls of Cossa are quite magnificent too. You see there's my partner Caroline posing uh, to show you the size of these walls that are still standing. Um, again, the guidebooks on say that they are Roman, but George Dennis cites um, earlier writers, Roman writers, saying that the walls of Cossa were ancient, long before the Etruscans and that um, Cossa was built by a, a mythical race um, who survived the flood. So I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Must uh, look at that. <clears throat> and the, the, the megalithic gate at Cossa, if, if it was Roman, there would have been an arched gate here, but there's no arched gate. It was probably uh, breached by a lintel, which has now been broken up by farmers. The, the strange thing is, Cossa wasn't even on the tourist route. Um, there was, uh, we've, we found one sign about 10 miles from the site leading to it, but then all the signs disappeared. Um, and we virtually had to almost rely upon dowsing to find it. And um, when we did find it, there was just a lay-by and some tiny little museum with an old lady in there. It was, it was a shock to see us arrive. <laughs> so it's... And I felt, this is amazing. This is the most magnificent megalithic site I've seen in Italy. And there's, 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 there's no mention of it in the guidebooks. And there's just one person here. Um, and it was all overgrown. And this is, this is a, a, a flavour of what was to come. As, uh, George Dennis also spoke of, of Saturnia, uh, which is in the, the great Tufa Valley of uh, Pitliagano, further down. Uh, it's, it's famous for its hot baths, springs, but um, it also has this amazing Roman gate, um, which has these incredibly sophisticated, closely knit, jointed polygonal walls. And some of these stones are, are quite massive. Um, again, they said this is Roman from the Roman gate. Well, I can see this is Roman work, but not this. <clears throat> and they weren't even connected. It's as if some great cataclysm destroyed the polygonal walls around Saturnia and left this piece, and the Romans just built onto it. That was my opinion. Uh, then we look into the folklore and we ask the local people about the legends of Saturnia and said it was the first city built by the Pelasgians. Uh, um, this was the first time we'd heard this name of um, a sort of prehistoric seafaring culture who settled in Italy and built these megalithic walls. <clears throat>
But of course, the writers see them as semi-mythical people, rather like the Merovingians. Um, so we decided to investigate some of the Pelasgian sites. <clears throat> and um, we discovered that some of the Pelasgian sites have these megalithic dolmen-type tombs, uh, like we see in this country, in Cornwall, and in, in of course, France. Uh, and also megalithic stones, this one here called the Hand of Orlando, which is um, about eight feet, nine feet tall, with what looks like five fingers. But it, each um, split has a viewing point to a particular hill on the horizon, which, of course, Giovanni Fio has been writing about. <clears throat> so that megalithic stone stands just outside of Saturnia, and as, as does this tomb. Because what you do find at these sites that, okay, they're Roman on the, in the inside, they're ancient on the exterior walls, but you find the tombs not far from the walls are all different from different periods, from the people who built the later monuments and the people who built the earlier walls. But they're all catalogued as the same period. So the Pelasgians, they were the <coughs> supposed to have merged with the Etruscans, um, according to some. Some say the Pelasgians were giants and known as titans. Um, they were, Sir Homer said they were a maritime people known as the divine Pelasgi. They worshipped Hermes and Saturn and the goddess, of course, um, which Giovanni Fio has also written about their um, worship of the goddess. Um, they built cities in the Peloponnese in southern Greece, Greece on the mainland, Troy and Crete, according to some writers. Um, they even introduced art into Greece, according to others. Um, they were race destroying a Bronze Age cataclysm or a flood, possibly the 3100 BC flood, lots of writers refer to. <clears throat> um, they were also known nomadic people and discoverers of the first sea routes. Uh, they also became known as the people of the storks, which is a, a sort of fascinating um, theory. So, Orbitello was one of the enigmatic sites in, in Italy because uh, these walls are now flooded by the sea. But originally they were freestanding um, as a, a, a citadel um, or actually platform for a temple. But over the um, centuries or thousands of years, um, the water light levels have changed in that area and now they're half underwater. And you can see where they've been repaired and added to in later times. But these walls are so tough and so well put together because they don't have mortar between the joints. They're free, freely locked together. And they're earthquake proof. So if an earthquake occurs, these walls just move with the earthquake and rattle around and then even tighten up again at the end of it. So whoever built these walls understood um, the, the sort of mechanics of, uh, of wall building and, and, and built the most sophisticated walls in the world. <clears throat> and we see in some of the greatest ancient civilizations, even in Peru, the polygonal walls are still an enigma there. They don't know how old they are. They're impossible because they weigh several tons and they fit together uh, in a way um, that stonemasons would find it impossible to do today. <clears throat> So one of these sites, we was um, not far from Orbitello, was Santa Severa, which is a castle, but it has something unusual in its lower walls. Santa Severa is now um, nearer Rome on the coast, not too far away from all the other sites. Around the castle, the foundation stones are polygonal. Of course, the Italians have just refuted over these walls. They don't see anything significant in their history. Um, certainly beyond the Roman times. Um, and these are massive blocks again. Uh, but half of this site is underwater. You can just see some of the foundations of the old harbour sticking out the water at low tide. And this is how it looked in its ancient times. Uh, this is now reclaimed by the sea. And there's only this part here is the castle. But the walls spread around here. And you can find these polygonal walls still in the undergrowth. So, Robert Mortari, uh, an Italian researcher, has made a study of the sea level changes around the coast of Lazio and has carbon dated marine organisms such as lithodromes that inhabit the holes in the limestone when it's underwater. 
And also he discovered in the geological layers of the area that matter from organic matter from mangrove trees that grew in a warmer climate or in some of the layers. So you, you basically tell what um, period the sea levels were and, and how they changed. So that they actually increased at one stage and then dropped and then increased again and then dropped. Um, putting all these data together and looking at the walls of, of uh, Pygri and Orbitello, he came up with these early dates that um, Pygri dates to actually 3000 BC and Orbitello back to 5000 BC. Um, and this is new information and um, what he's done is pretty amazing actually. And of course, I thought it was ironic that somebody had sprayed this on the wall. Because it is coming around. You see, you can't bury the truth. Um, you can't bury history. Although successive governments um, politically have buried our history, but um, it always creeps back to the surface, doesn't it? Um, so we decided to look on the research the trail of the Pelasgians. Of course, the ancient writers said that there were traces of the um, Pelasgians in ancient Greece, in the Peloponnese, <coughs> and in Crete, um, and Troy. <coughs> so we thought, thought we'd, we'd have a look around the ancient cities of the Peloponnese first, and this is said to be a Pelasgian site. Um, although it's not polygonal, <coughs> the massive scale of these stones is still extremely impressive. Um, may have been built by, um, in the a Bronze Age group. Some say that the walls um, date from Roman times as usual, but others say they go back to 3000 BC. In fact, Homer said that the walls of, of Tyrans um, were built by the giants back in the days after the flood. But of course, archaeologists and historians ignore myths and legends um, because, yes, they are exaggerated. Um, but there's always a grain of truth I sometimes find in these old traditions. This is one of the corridors through Tyrans. Uh, some of the architecture was actually magnificent, but in sort of giant blocks. So then um, we, we heard there was a pyramid somewhere on the Peloponnese called Hellenicon. <clears throat> and that, there was a lot of controversy around this pyramid because scientists have dated it through thermoluminescence to a period of 3000 BC, or roughly around there. And interestingly enough, it's made of the same style of masonry as the walls in Italy. Um, it's, it's, it's unlike the polygonal masonry that you see at Delphi, which are smaller stones beautifully put together. This is more like the polygonal walls of Italy. <clears throat> this one stands, of course, in Argos, in Greece, not too far away from Tyrans. Um, and it's not a great, it's not a large pyramid, but um, the dating is key here because you know, this type of walling goes back to 2720 BC, the time before the Great Pyramid was built. <coughs> so it, it's clear to us that um, polygon walling belonged to a culture um, that survived um, some kind of cataclysm and erected the pyramids in Egypt, the walls in Italy, possibly the walls in Peru, <clears throat> so we also then had a look at some of the Pelasgian sites in the mainland Greece and then we came to the great oracle at um, Nacramentio um, and here we saw polygonal walls at the very foot of Roman walls and beautifully knitted together with arches polygonal masonry and of course Legends say that this Nacramentio dates back to the gods of, of ancient Greece. <clears throat> Oinidae is one of my favourite places. <clears throat> Oinidae is very little visited. Uh, it's on the coast of um, Greece, <clears throat> on the west side of Greece, not far from below Parga, but um, above the canal. <clears throat> and um, what we discovered here was this great fenced off site that um, was protected and owned by the, um, the EEC. And um, they'd put this great 10-foot 
fencing all the way around this site. <clears throat> and there was just one old lady that was there with her knitting, taking admission. And she hadn't seen, I don't think she'd seen people for a long time. And we came along and mm -hmm. saw this magnificent site. And uh, there was signs saying no photographs. You know, forbidden filmings, filmings forbidden. So I might be arrested after this presentation. So. But what we found at this site was key to this lecture because here we see this is typical Hellenic masonry which you find in ancient Greece dating from 500 BC to the Roman times. You see this typical sort of angled joints haphazardly. That's typical of Hellenic masonry from ancient Greece. But here you see that a polygonal wall um, has been knitted into this more modern wall because the masons who built these walls could not produce these. So obviously these are earlier and built by a more sophisticated race who um, could not, um, they couldn't um, reproduce. So then we were told that, that Crete was one of the centres of the Pelasgians but uh, as we spent two weeks looking around every site in Crete, we couldn't find any signs of polygonal walls until the very last day I had an intuition because there were, were signs um, of villages up in the hill called Gregory, um, which reminded me of the fallen angels. I thought there must be something in this area because there was all kinds of strange names to do with Nephilim, Gregory and giants. And, and sure enough, on the top of this hill, there's ruins of an ancient city known as Axos. And at Axos, we found this trace of, of polygonal wall, the only polygonal wall on, on Crete. <clears throat> and of course, something had destroyed this site from a great tsunami and flattened the wall, the whole site. It looks either the 1500 BC or 1400 BC eruption of Thera caused the destruction or something much earlier. But we were looking at the remains of an ancient city that was destroyed in some great cataclysm, that's for sure. So this is a Pelasgian site called Axos in Crete. And then, of course, we heard that there was another Pelasgian site on the mainland Turkey. And here we see a typical polygonal wall of the Pelasgians. <coughs> and that was called Assos. It was similar to Axos. But uh, returning to Italy, we we'd, uh, began more research and found there are Pelasgian sites south of Rome that are even more fascinating than the ones we'd been visiting north of Rome. <clears throat> so first of all, we decided to visit Palestrina, where there was a great temple to the goddess built by the Etruscans that seemed to have been built on a, a previous temple to these Pelasgians. And here we see Palestrina, which is just south to the, well, southeast of Rome. And as soon as we arrived, we noticed polygonal walls running through the local cafe, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and then we went up to the temple, and this is an incredible sight. Um, the views from over here are actually amazing, because the emperors of Rome used to uh, stay in this area of Italy during the summer, because it's cooler. Um, but the polygonal walls here are at a massive height. And below them, they're all in terraces, so it looks as if these are foundation stones that are in, but they're not. They're just terracing, and this is a Roman terrace. That's an earlier terrace, even though it's above it. So that, of course, confuses a lot of historians to think, oh, well, these have to be Romans, because that's Roman masonry. But in even the restaurant in the evening, we found a polygonal wall at the back of the restaurant, so this is polygonal shire. It was a fantastic place. And then we journeyed over to Amelia. Um, and it's interesting that Amelia has just had an earthquake um, about a year ago, I think. And part of a polygonal wall had collapsed, um, giving some people an idea of how sophisticated the stones were. But they'd survived. Uh, Amelia's had earthquakes for over for thousands of years, very regularly. But only until now, part of the polygonal wall has actually fallen. So they've, they've served their purpose very well. But because the stone there is of a particular type of limestone, the joints have worn and fractured. But when they were new, there would be no gaps at all in these joints. <coughs> but a lap tree was one of our favourite places, a little bit further down south from Rome. You can see a lap tree there, further down, further southeast. 
um, we came across great megalithic walls and this incredible stone lintel, which um, is this whole piece here. Um, <coughs> it's equivalent to something you'd find at the Brown, Brown Dolmen in Ireland, one of the largest megaliths in Italy. And even the interior had uh, massive megaliths that were over seven feet tall by about eight feet wide, <coughs> weighing several tons. So we were starting to see some really impressive walls south of Rome. And here, the highest I've ever seen. This one is over 40 feet high because it goes down much further here. So imagine getting your ladders up there and um, some of these stones weighing several tons and some bloke saying, right, take a bit more off the bottom there, Jack. Right, put it up there. <laughs> How did they do it? <coughs> so Norba was one of my favourite sites because it's a spectacular setting. It's one of, one of these hilltop um, citadels, <coughs> miles from any town. <coughs> and here we found the first round tower polygonal, a place called Norba in the same sort of area nearer the coast. And this is one of my favourite pictures. Strangely enough, this, this picture has been circulated around the internet, even though I've never published it. I don't know how that happened, but uh, somebody once said to me, how do you know it's yours? Well, I'm standing there. <laughs> it's got to be my picture. Oh. Here's Caroline next to some of these massive blocks. So that brought me to, in the end to Cortona, because um, some of you may know Cortona, we've actually been there. It's, it's one of those um, real tourist towns that um, a lot of Americans go there because that, that film, uh, I forget the name of it now, was, was, was um, made and it's all about an American settling in Cortona and falling in love with the place. And um, so it's, it's a big tourist uh, industry, but very few people know that it has an incredible age. <clears throat> George Dennis sa says that amongst Italian historians, Cortona has the, the most ancient walls. But, and they're said to be earlier than the polygonal walls. And I thought, well, that's pretty impossible. But. So I, I went through the myths and, of course, Virgil, a great writer in Roman times, claims Dardanus founded Cortona, who travelled to the Orient to build the great city of Troy. Um, so, and that was fascinating. And I, of course, said that Ulysses supposed to have ended his life in Cortona. It was the third city in Italy to be built after the flood. Uh, uh, Dionys Dionysus, or Harkansus, writes a memorable city of the Umbrians and that it was taken from them by the Pelasgi, who used it as a bulwark against them, seeing it was well fortified. So, and it's also one of the 12 great cities of the Etruscans. <clears throat> but it, uh, writers say, it's retained its Pelasgic character. So we, we sort of went to the centres, through all the bars and um, shops, and had a look down um, to the base of the city and found some of the walls and started to look at them. And here we found, again, massive blocks. This, is, um, this piece here is longer than the van. <coughs> and they weigh, because they're almost as thick as they are long, they are mass truly massive stones. But they're not polygonal. They're not shaped in a polygonal way. They're, they are fitted together very, very closely, but it's the, the, the amount of wear on these stones, because these stones are sarsen stones. They're made of, like, grey wacky. Uh, very hard glacial sandstone like the stones of Avebury. So they're, they're extremely hard. And if you look at the wear on them, you know, it doesn't take an expert to work out that these stones are of a great age indeed. In fact, the, the, most of the stones, very, very little of them, survive because they've been worn away. Apart from one section, which is so inaccessible, it took us three or four days to, to discover where it was and, and even get near it. It's called Terra Mozza, <clears throat> and it's supposed to be the most massive wall in Italy. Now, this is taken with a telephoto lens. Uh, it's the nearest I could get to this site because um, there's private property in front of it and that, that's let out to holding makers, so you can't go through their grounds. There's barbed wire around it. Um, but behind, and only in the winter, which this was in February, and we, we went there recently, there, 
Can you get this view because vegetation completely um, overgrows it um, after the springtime? But you can see there's, there's an, an Etruscan wall <coughs> at the back here. Um, and these what look like miniature stones, but they're actually quite large. <laughs> and here we have these. Now that block there, um, thanks to George Dennis who went up and measured it, um, measures um, eight feet high by uh, 13 feet wide. So <clears throat> it, it, they are massive blocks. And I w one day I'll probably get near it and uh, with permissions, but it's difficult if you don't speak the language. But I did find a slide of a wall that is, is almost equivalent to Terramoza. Uh, this is a Phoenician wall, possibly Pelasgian, from Ruad Island off the coast of Syria. Now this is not far from the Baalbek sort of areas with the great stones. But um, as you can see, the walls of Terramoza are similar to this. And they just have this great ancient feel to them. They just... But what's fascinating was that the people who built those walls also buried their dead around the city. So, and they were, these places, these tombs are an embarrassment to archaeologists because um, <clears throat> they're unusual. They're nothing like any tombs found anywhere else around Etruscan cities or even polygonal cities. They're of a circular design, which sort of brings ideas that they could be Greek. Um, but they have these massive stones. Uh, these, these are modern infills to keep the soil away, but generally all the blocks are of massive um, size. And they, they were built up and then had a kind of domed roof. And some say they were covered in earth. And here's another one. Um, and they always, they always feature in, in mystery history books of Italy um, because they're so unusual and their type of, of, of roofing or arching was to have this semicircular stone and then lay out these great monoliths across them, angled. Um, it's the most difficult way of creating a roof, but they were so gifted with, with cutting stone that they could do it. There's lots of easier ways to create an arch. Um, and all this is carved out. This was found buried deep. Uh, this wasn't just, this hadn't survived as it stood. It's been excavated out. So it's been preserved. <clears throat> so, and then I noticed some of the, the jointing on it was absolutely perfect. So were these the stones, were these, were these stones, do these stones belong to a civilization that built these ancient megalithic walls? Um, unfortunately, with no organic matter or, or mortar inside the joints of these um, tombs, <clears throat> there's no way of dating them, although they found later burials that have been placed around them, uh, which they often say takes it to about 500 BC. Um, they could well be earlier because often um, people reuse the burial sites of their ancestors. And the joints are, are actually immaculate. They're like the pyramids in Egypt. Which brings us further down the coast to Kumai, which is carved out of solid rock, and it was a Pelasgian oracle. And uh, Pelasgian oracle is um, quite an amazing place, this uh, Kumai, because it, um, it echoes and it has an amazing energy to it as you walk down this corridor. That's Kuma, not far from Naples. But just, um, just outside the, um, the oracle is this um, plaque that says, basically in Latin, that Dardanus um, dis <coughs> built a temple to the goddess on this site. So again, we have this sort of legends that associate the Pelasgians with Dardanus and Troy and all these early seafarers. And um, I came across in northern Italy, these stones that are said to be Pelasgian. And they show these unusual daggers with the pummeled ha handle. And they seem to be unique to the Pelasgians. They're found at Pelasgian sites. And um, they also appear on stones more familiar to us. Some might recognize these because they come from this monument. So we wondered whether Pelasgians had made a connection with this country, and certainly with the Great Stones. It's 
So our journey is continuing further south of Rome where we'd heard there's incredible polygonal walls at Terracina and other places. And um, we're sure we're going to find some even more fascinating places, but the myths around the Palastri is certainly fascinating, but the results of the testing and dating, um, certainly from the, uh, the layers and the carbon dating of sea creatures in the walls, certainly put these, uh, some of them back to pre-flood times of 5000 BC. So it seems to me that perhaps in Turkey we have the earliest civilizations who, because they found polygonal walls in Turkey dating from those times, um, that they spread into Italy around 5000 BC and carried on building all the way up until probably around about two and a half thousand BC where um, their walls were replaced by regular masonry. <clears throat> the technology was lost. And maybe some of the survivors went over to Peru. I said it's, um, it's just a theory, but you know, who knows? Um, so that's, that's it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Hello, yeah. How closely do these polygonal walls resemble um, similar structures like in Cusco, in Peru, and other places in, outside Europe? Um, how identical are they? Because, yeah, cause they look very similar to me to these yes. structures you find in places like Cusco. That's which correct. Supposedly built by the Incas, but they're much older. Definitely. And I think the same peoples using the same technology were able to navigate the globe in prehistoric times. Um, certain boats have been found that, even the ones around the pyramids, show that seafaring was going on in the Bronze Age and before, and I'm, and I'm sure that um, before certain cataclysms have happened to this planet, that the sea levels may be different, sea navigation of the globe was easier, um, but that's quite controversial as well. Uh, so I think probably the Pelasgians is a name given to these sort of followers of the stork, or the swan, if you like, um, who came out of Turkey, possibly the Middle East, and with this great technology, and built places like Cusco um, when they arrived in Central America. Um, wherever you find the polygonal walls, I think, and you will find them if you look hard enough, and I think there's evidence of them in Germany, apparently, because the, the Pelasgians actually went as far up as the, uh, past the Italian Alps into the German Alps. So that's another thing. And there's also rumor that polygonal walls uh, were built by um, <clears throat> this surviving race that the Romans tried to wipe out. And they pushed these people back into the Romanian Alps and they built polygonal walls there. Um, and this is recorded in the Trajan Column. So the, there, is, there were survivors that had this knowledge, and perhaps that knowledge of stone masonry has gone into sort of modern day Freemasonry, perhaps, um, as some, some authors suggest. So, thanks. <laughs> okay. Still got a few minutes left, so any more questions? Sorry, did that answer your question? <laughs> These structures seem to be like cliff-like um, faces, but did they actually enclose something? Or were they just on one side of something? Yeah, they, they always are enclosed. They're always circular walls. They're always enclosed some okay. kind of citadel. But um, the citadels often had no remains of anything ancient as the walls. But the Romans obviously had, had reused the, the, the building stones uh, that were inside these citadels. So. But yeah, they were always enclosing something, and that's the other mystery. Why did such a sophisticated race want to build such mighty walls? That is another question that nobody seems to sort of ask. It's as if, um, if they were so mighty and so great, why were they having to <laughs> put themselves in, within these great walls, as if they were fearful of something? So what were they fearful of, is the question. Um, and why were they earthquake-proof? 
you know. So these are the greatest, most sophisticated walls um, ever made. Even today, masons can't re reproduce these walls. So why? So we could say, yes, maybe there's, there's some force that, that, was, uh, that was greater than them that they needed to put these walls around them to protect them from. Some, they, I'm not going to the, the, the idea that there are uh, ancient aliens, but certainly there were sophisticated races on this planet long before, as even miners have found out of place artifacts in, at the bottoms of mine shafts several miles down. Um, that showed there was a sophisticated um, uh, race uh, thousands and millions of years ago. So, you know, we've only developed in a few thousand years. Um, there's a long, lot, lot of history in this planet, and some of these walls um, give us a window into that mystery. Another question? One more. Okay, we're going to make this the last question. Okay. Hi, Gary. Hi. Um, it, it, you mentioned that um, some of the walls were limestone, and you mentioned also use of sarsen stone. Yes. Is there um, a pattern of uh, yeah, what, what, what the type of stone is, yeah. and if so, is it local to the surrounding yeah. area, or did That's they bring it in? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that question up. I, I forgot to mention it before. That um, Yeah, they, they vary. Um, all the polygonal walls in Italy vary from um, limestone, um, which is sediment, um, tufa, which is volcanic ash, um, travertine, which is glacial limestone, which is very, very hard. Now, some of the experts in Italy say that polygonal walls must be made of, of, of certain types of um, of, of um, stone um, that split naturally into polygons. But travertine, as anybody knows who deals with stone, splits horizontally and is very difficult to make into polygonal walls. So, and it's very, very hard. It's, it's almost crystalline limestone. Um, in fact, we use it in the, back, in the backs of our fireplace now, travertine, it's, it's uh, very popular because it's cheap, but very hard. So. That whatever argument they put to us, we can always say, well, you know, there's, there's examples of, of uh, sarsen, travertine, extremely hard stones uh, that don't split naturally into polygons. So, yeah, there, there's no fair rule. Often the stones do come from the local quarries. That's shown that there is, but some of the quarries are a fair distance away from the citadels. Some say that they borrowed into the citadel itself, took the stone and used that to surround the walls, but there's not a lot of cases for that happening at all. So, again, rather like in South America, they'd, they'd haul the stones a long distance to create these walls. And they had, like this shows, um, a guttering system as well uh, throughout the city, but a sewage system, water system, so they were very sophisticated people. In order to build these walls, they had to be. Okay, so thank you very much.